This is the second episode of Black Movement Radio. I'm your host, Nikita X. And the topic we will be dealing with today is the red and the black Indian. Now today, I'm actually going to deal with several different topics. But I'm going to start off with a couple of quotes. The first quote I'm starting off with is from the book called Malaysians and Australians and the Peopling of America, Smithsonian Miscellaneous Collection, Volume 94, Number 11 by Alice Achartaleka, page 16. Now, Alice Achartaleka is a racist European and he was over the Smithsonian for a long time. He hid a lot of truths about um, black people being in America before Columbus. And I'm saying black again because that's the way I can uh, get the message across. Okay, and if you want to know more about Alice Achartaleka, go back and um, I actually did um, an analysis on the book, a critical analysis on the book, Malaysians and Australians and a Peopling of America. And it is uh, on my page. So you can go back and you can look at that. And I'll post a link d uh, below so you can go and, uh, and visit that uh, YouTube page and, and just kind of see what, uh, what, what the critical analysis was on it. Now, <clears throat> here is the quote. The quote goes like this. In 1775, the Pedro Francisco Garces visited Zuni, one of the southernmost Pablos, and found there two races of men and two languages. One part of the inhabitants showed a clear red color and handsome features. The others were black and ugly. An instructive native interrogated on the subject replied, that the red people had come from one of the Pablos that became ruined, while the blacks were the ancient inhabitants of the country. Now, dealing with the subject red and black Indians, you can see that when we're dealing with black Indians in this particular quote, black Indians were not slaves from Africa. They were not talking about them being enslaved to anybody. They were not talking about that they mixed with the red, the black, the African mixed with the uh, red Native American and now became a mixture. No, in this quote, it, he specifically says there were two races of men and there were two different languages. So as you can see, there was already a difference. Like one practice, they spoke this particular language, meaning that they probably had a completely different culture. So there was two races of men. One was a red one. He says one part of the inhabitants, they had a clear red color. Okay. And he said he visited the Zuni and, and uh, indigenous peoples, an indigenous tribe. He said one had a red clear color and handsome features. And of course, they're going to say, you know, they the red was handsome. And he said the others were black and ugly. Now, of course, he's going to say that because, you know, of course, the quote is going to be like this because they're going to he's going to say one is black and ugly because, you know, he was racist. OK, so we got to get past the racist things that they say. So now in this quote, we know that there's two races of men. There was two different languages. One part of the people were red. The other part of the people were black people. OK, so um, an instructive an instructed native interrogated on the subject, asked about the subject, replied. This was the red man's reply. He said that the red people, his people, had come from one of the Pablos that became ruined, while the blacks were the ancient inhabitants of the country. So this means that the black people were there before the red people came. Okay? So they, it's not, in this quote, they're not talking about slavery. They're not talking about any mixture that happened. Uh, this is a second quote. This is from the book, The First Americans Were Africans by Dr. M. Hotel. Now, <clears throat> this quote says, according to, to Dogon Priest, 
Dogon is a tribe in uh, Africa, nation in Africa. Uh, according to the Dogon priest, Naba Lamosa Marodin, Marodin Big, the continent of North America was known as Melanesia, which means land of the people of melanin, simply because the America of that day was the country of the black man. So even in Africa, they knew that America was at one time the country of black people. Okay. And it was called Melanesia because it was so much melanin. It was, you know, so much, uh, so many black people. And this is from the book, The First Americans Were Africans by Dr. David M. Hotel. Now, people want to say that Africans did not travel to America before Columbus. But how did this Dogon priest know that America was at one time the country of the black man where only black people were there? So that's two quotes. One of them is from a red Indian. The other one is from a um, black man, uh, a, a, a man from a black nation in Africa, the priest of the Dogon peoples. And so, um, so these two quotes right here are not talking about the presence of black people coming from slavery. They're talking about black people were the inhabitants, the ancient inhabitants of the land. Okay. So now when we get, when we get to the book, Black Indians, A Hidden Heritage by William Lauren Katz, the topic is African peoples were leaders of Indians. So we have to deal with this. Okay. Because there was a reclassification of black Indians into Africans. So if you were someone who were, was a black Indian and, you know, because everyone has this, you know, image in their head of, of, of what an Indian looks like. Well, then if you are a black Indian, then they would automatically classify you as African. Okay. And we already know about the racial, racial classifications. Now, here are some key things that stuck out in my mind when reading the book, Black Indians, A Hidden Heritage by William Lauren Katz. On page 41, William Lauren Katz write, writes, Africans, as experts on tropical agriculture, had to teach both Indians and Europeans. So the Africans, you mean to tell me, had to teach both the Indians and the Europeans. So the people that they're calling Africans probably most likely were indigenous Indians who were dark skinned, reclassified as African because they knew the land better than the people that they called Indians. This, that doesn't even make sense to me. Now, when we go to page 55, the next quote, in that same book says, from the beginning of Seminole colonization in Florida, writes Opala, the Indian may have depended upon African farmers for their survival. So again, they're saying that the Indian had to depend upon the African farmers for them to survive, for their, form for their farming skills. So that means that the people that they're calling African in this book, William Lauren Katz is calling African, these people knew the land better than Indians. So you mean to tell me that the Indians were indigenous peoples and we're going to stick with the, you know, the traditional narrative that most people know, which, which we know there's more to that, but that the first peoples came from, uh, from Asia to America at 20,000 years ago. Okay, so you mean to tell me you've been on the land for 20,000 years and the Africans were better farmers than you? That does not make sense. That means the people that they're calling Africans most likely were indigenous Americans who were dark skinned. Now, uh, let me go to another quote. And right now, we're, we're going to even deal with the warfare uh, of Indians. Now, this is on page 29. Okay. It says, 
Soon after they landed, some Africans escaped into the woods and found a new home amongst the Native Americans. Later than later that year, Governor Ovenato sent a request to King Ferdinand that no more Africans be sent to the Americas. His reasoning was simple. They fled amongst the Indians and taught them bad customs and never could be captured. Now, now these people that they're saying are Africans, they went to, they fled amongst the Indians, okay? And they taught the Indians bad customs. So the African people were leaders, even, even in warfare, even in teaching them to rebel. So these are things that we must think about when they classify these people as Africans. Now, it was not only Africans who were fle fleeing to, uh, to Indian, you know, uh, towns or Indian, um, Indian communities. It was also Indians who were fleeing to Indian communities. Now on page 33, William Lauren Katz write, writes, the remaining enslaved Indians fled their masters and created their own secret colonies beyond European eyes. Again, the remaining enslaved Indians fled their masters and created their own secret colonies beyond European eyes, okay? And um, before that, they say increasingly Africans and the remaining enslaved Indians. Okay, so at that time, we know that Indians were also enslaved. Indians would also flee. So again, if you were dark skinned, then they would automatically just throw you into the African category, okay? So now what we're seeing is is the reclassification of dark-skinned indigenous peoples to African. But as we can see, Africans had better farming skills. They were also teaching the Indians, as they say, bad customs, meaning rebellious customs. All right. Um, now, I want to deal with another subject. That the African women, so-called African women, they actually led Indian communities. They were leaders in the Indian communities. Now, this is on page 12. I'm going to read this quote. It says, two colonial Brazilian black Indian communities were commanded by African women and another African maroon settlement in 1826 in Brazil was ruled by a black woman named Zephyrina, who successfully led her forces against towns and plantations in Bahia. So, as we can already see, that two Brazilian black Indians community, they were all these these Indian communities were led by African so-called African women. Now, let me go to another uh, quote where it also deals with this, this is on page 45. Okay, it says, women played a crucial role in maroon life and were considered for leadership. Philippa Maria Aranha, an African, ruled a thriving colony in Amazonia, Brazil. Her daring forces against the Portuguese army sent her village, sent against her village, not only defeated them, but convinced the enemy it was wiser to negotiate than try to defeat her. At the bar bargaining table, Aranha won her people's liberty and sovereignty. In Passenha, Brazil, the Portuguese discovered Mali, Malali Indians and Africans living under the rule of another African woman. So right now we have the African women leading these maroon communities, these black Indian communities with black Indians, Africans, African women were leading the Indian communities. So they were leaders over the Indians. They had um, better um, farming skills. So they knew the land better and they were better fighters, but they're calling these people African. I do not believe that these people were African. I believe that they were indigenous black Indians that they are calling 
Africans, okay, that they've reclassified as Africans. Now let's look at the fighting, the, the, the fighting that took place, the warfare that took place uh, amongst the black Indians, okay? Quote, this is on page 73 of Black Indians, A Hidden Heritage. Quote, the strongest country in the new world had received a stunning defeat at the hands of a small band of black Indian guerrilla fighters. The Battle of Okeechobee became the most decisive upset in the United States, and they suffered in more than four decades of warfare in Florida. But since the Seminoles had finally abandoned the battle scene, Colonial Taylor claimed a victory. Okay, so this quote is about how these black Indian guerrilla fighters, they fought against the United States for four decades of warfare. And they said this was the most decisive upset the United States suffered in more than four decades of warfare in Florida. So this showing that um, how these small bands of black Indian guerrilla fighters whoop the United States butt. So you mean to tell me these black Indians were better at warfare than had one of the strongest battles than any other Indians? Okay. So these people that they're calling black Indians and, um, and Africans, these people are indigenous, dark-skinned peoples, all right? And they're calling them black Indians because they want to say that they're black because of the African, uh, the African heritage due to the slave trade. And so we know by the uh, previous two quotes that that's not true. Now, what happened to these black Indians, you know? Because there was some kind of division that happened, and it was a division that was based on color. The uh, Indian nations, indigenous nations were victims of that as well. And that's something that we have to deal with, that we were fighting amongst each other before the European came. Uh, and then there were different nations indigenous nations who were fighting amongst each other, who would grab slaves, you know. And so it wasn't, we weren't living in peace with one another, you know, not always. See what I'm saying? So we can't make up a narrative that's not true. There was warfare amongst ourselves even before the Europeans stepped foot on the land, okay? And because because if we were united, they would have never defeated us. And this is what we're dealing with today is the division, all right? So, um, I want to deal first with page, uh, 35. And in page 35, let me get this quote. All right. And page 35, <clears throat> uh, still reading from the same book, Black Indians, A Hidden Heritage. Quote, the European policy of divide and conquer that began on Christmas Day, 1522, introduced elements of deep division to the Americas. Slavery and its cruel legacy left a bloody trail across the grass and soil of the Americas. It spread southward and westward from the Caribbean to Mexico and along the coastline of South America to Cape Horn, where Atlantic and Pacific Oceans meet. So this division that they're talking about, they said they introduced deep division to the Americas. All right. So they were constantly trying to uh, divide us by color, um, by, by slavery, all of these different things. All right. So now page 63, I'm going to do another quote and go deeper into this reality of division. Quote, to disrupt racial alliance, U.S. officials promoted slavery amongst the Seminoles. Of the five nations, only the Seminoles rejected the kind of slavery the United States wanted. 
Wealthy Creeks who owed their riches to slave labor were sent to persuade Seminole chiefs to become slave masters. White and Creek Indians were encouraged to raid Seminole villages for slaves. Free Seminole men, women, and children were carried off and sold in Southern slave markets. So basically the Seminoles did not at that time want to deal with slavery. So the Creek Indians were working alongside the whites to capture other free Seminole men, women, and children. And they sold them off into Southern slave markets, meaning that they sold these Seminole people, Indian people, off into slavery. Now, when they sold them off, they were probably reclassified as African peoples. And this was also a division amongst color. As you can see, the Creeks were working with the whites, okay? And the Seminoles did not want to participate in slavery, and so they carried off free peoples who were Seminole Indians, and they sold them on slave markets. All right, let's go to a, another quote. Okay, this is page 154, and I'm kind of skipping around because I want to get back to another topic. Now, page 54, it says, soon two distinct classes based on slave ownership divided each Indian nation. Mixed bloods owned slaves and usually had some white ancestry. Listen to this again. Mixed bloods owned slaves and usually had some white ancestry. Between 1830 and 1860, the populations of the four nations declined sharply. Cherokees by 31%, Choctaws by 27%, Chickasaws by 18%, Creeks by 43%. At the same time, the number of members with white blood increased, and so did the numbers of slaves each nation had. Slavery had become the major economic and political factor in these nations. This meant that their racial thinking was approaching that of the white South. So think about that. What divided these, what would divide a nation in itself was slavery. And so you would see that the mixed bloods that had the white ancestry they began to practice slavery against their own people because they were darker skinned. They said their thinking became that of the white South. Because their thinking became that of the white South, then they began to hold people in slavery. And usually it was black Indians. They were not African peoples or people from Africa. These were black Indians who were being held, being held as slavery, in, in slavery. These are black Indians who were snatched from other tribes, sold on slave markets. But they want to tell us that these black Indians were Africans. No, it was much deeper than that. Now, uh, this is the last. I'm going to do two more quotes. And I'm going to kind of sum up this discussion, okay? This is another one, another part I want to bring up. And this is how they were able to keep our people confused. It's another way the U.S. government was able to um, keep black Indians confused and keep us confused about our indigenous heritage, okay? Okay. And this is a way that we were reclassified as Africans or however they wanted to classify us as. Now, this is in still from the book, Black Indians, A Hidden Heritage. This is page 112. All right, quote, this idea of keeping slaves distant from their homes and families was crucial to having them under strict control. British merchants took Indians enslaved on the mainland and shipped them to the West Indies. This was the only safe way to enslave Native Americans for bondage, for bondage was only secure when its victims had nowhere to turn to, no family or friends nearby. So this shows you right there that when 
black Indians were getting sold on slave markets and they were getting enslaved by uh, different, maybe different Indian nations. These black Indians were also sent from the places where they were at to other places. So they said they would enslave them on the mainland, ship them to the West Indies. And you could come and you could arrive on the West Indies and all of a sudden become an African. You see what I'm saying? And you don't know because you don't know that you, you've been stripped from your family. So you think you're somewhere else than, than where you're originally, when, than you were originally at. And let's say if you're a child and they, and they take you and they ship you to, you're in North America, they ship you to South America. You don't know where you came, so they can just tell you they got you from Africa and then they have you believing that. You see what I'm saying? So uh, we have to really use our minds and think here about what actually happened. While to, to avoid them from rebelling and running back to their families, they would nat naturally strip you away from your family and sail you up and down the coast of North and South America. All right. And when they were selling you up and down the coast of North and South America, also taking taking you black Indian to Africa and to Europe, you would also be reclassified. And sometimes what they would do is they would bring they would ship them to Africa or ship them to Europe and they would bring them back and they would brand them. And then they show up in the slave markets as Negroes without a place of origin being mentioned. That was um it was Jack D. Forbes. Uh, that's what he said in his book, Africans and Native Americans. Now, um, it was another quote I wanted to share. Oh, this is another one. This is another way that uh, our identity was stolen and also our land was stolen. Okay. This is uh, from page 141, Black Indians, A Hidden Heritage. Quote, it says, Whites looked at Native American villages in the South and found black faces staring back at them. Let me read that again. Whites looked at Native American villages in the South and found black faces staring back at them. Paranoia told whites that these people were about to rise up, liberate slaves, and kill whites. This haunting black presence spelled a trouble or doom that had to be dealt with. One hysterical, re one hysterical response was to demand that state legislators remove Indians from tax-exempt lands and drive them away. So right here you see Native American villages with black folks, indigenous folks that were dark-skinned. The white folks was afraid that they was going to rise up, liberate the enslaved other Indians that they had enslaved and kill all the whites. So they said what they must do as white people is that the demand that the state legislator remove Indians from tax exempt lands, remove these black indigenous peoples from these tax exempt lands and drive them away. Okay. Now I'm going to close this out <clears throat> with something I kind of wrote up. All right. After so-called black people were denationalized, they were enslaved by pale Europeans. The remaining black Indians were then removed from their lands by the U.S. government. The ones who still belonged to their nation was, still, was then enslaved by mixed pale Europeans who adopted the attitude of Southern racist. So I hope you um, enjoy this episode, episode two, and I want to hear from you. You know, what are your thoughts um, about what was discussed? So again, I'm your host, Nikita X, and I want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, I want to hear your thoughts and what you have to say about this subject. Peace, love, and light, everybody. <laughs>